I have a podcast called Rehash. I co-host it with my friend Hannah, and it's all about internet phenomena that get us all up in arms only to forget about them within a week. So we rehash them, as they say. We just concluded our fifth season, which is all about what happens when art meets the internet. Is the sun rising on a new creative era, or has it set before it even began? Go check it out. Anyone who's even so much as heard of a horror movie knows how often old ladies appear in this genre. If it's Jason's mom in Friday the 13th, or that naked ghost that climbs out of the bathtub in The Shining, or the corpse of Norman Bates' mother in Psycho, or Pearl in X, horror films seem to know that one thing that scares people more than anything is an elderly lady. And even worse, her body. Of course, the old woman, or hag, fulfills a wide range of symbolic purposes within the horror genre. She plays the role of castrating mother, horrific harridan, neighborhood witch. Most recently, she appeared in Coralie Farjot's hit body horror film, The Substance. The Substance stars Demi Moore and Margaret Qualley, and it's been making waves for what many people perceive as a very timely commentary on the gendered anti-aging culture of this current moment. Moore plays Elizabeth Sparkle, a Jane Fonda-esque aging aerobics star who's presented with an alluring subscription-style drug that allows her to create a younger, perkier version of herself. The two halves of the self split their time with a substance every seven days, the catch being that both halves must always remember that they are one and the same. What happens is what you could predict, knowing what kind of movie this is. Elizabeth's younger self, Sue, played by Quali, usurps Elizabeth's job and begins to enjoy her life as a beautiful young woman, quickly abusing the substance and chewing into Elizabeth's seven days. This results in Elizabeth's body rapidly aging against her will, and Elizabeth, being so unhappy with her life as an older woman, allowing Sue to abuse her until it's too late. The two have a violent clash where Sue defeats Elizabeth, but without her other half, Sue's body falls apart. She breaks yet another rule of the substance by trying to reanimate herself and becomes a deformed hybrid of the two women named Monstra Alyssa Sue. Persistent, Alyssa Sue attends the New Year's Eve special she's starring in and horrifies the audience who, in a scene reminiscent of Carrie's blood-filled prom, humiliate, attack, and ultimately vanquish her. Elizabeth's face breaks off the remains of Alyssa Sue and drags itself to her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, repeating the first shot of the film before melting into a bloody puddle. Now, the substance takes inspiration from what I see to be two different subsects of horror, hagsploitation, or psycho-bitty films, and body horror. It's got all the gendered young woman, older woman dynamics of a hagsploitation film, and all the grotesque, gratuitous gore of a body horror movie, and I think it does a lot of this quite well. It's got a great score and wonderful practical effects, and unleashes a balls-to-the-wall insane third act that makes the movie a lot of fun. Its politics are also in the right place. It poses a compelling philosophical inquiry into the concept of time and the symbiosis of our younger and older selves, showing how the hedonistic neglect of our younger bodies is a form of abuse towards our older selves. How beauty is compulsive and addictive. These themes are all very obvious in the film. I recognized all of this about the substance, yet I still left the theater with a strange feeling. Something about the film felt like, while it was attempting to say something poignant about women's fears of aging, it actually risked contradicting that message. So I want to look at two films that I think heavily influenced the substance, Robert Aldrich's Whatever Happened to Baby Jane and David Cronenberg's The Fly, to explore the delicate balance between empathy and exploitation within these particular conventions of horror, and how the substance threatens to tip into the latter. If the body really is a temple, why are we so afraid of it? For the first half of the 20th century, horror movies were about fantastical monsters. Zombies, ghosts, vampires. 
But in 1960, one movie came and changed that forever. Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, about a murderous motel proprietor named Norman Bates, shifted the focus of horror from the fantastical to the mundane. The monster was no longer a mythical beast, but rather a beast that lies within us all, one that only society can bring out. What Psycho popularized was a fear of the normal, people who are so brought down and traumatized by the horrors of everyday life that they end up deranged. Norman Bates is the murderous antagonist of Psycho, but the big twist is that he believes himself to be his own mother, who he killed before the start of the film, and whose mummified corpse he keeps in his basement. Norman, as mother, kills the women Norman is attracted to, including our protagonist Marion, in fits of jealous rage. And the monster in Norman is one produced by an increasingly isolated, alienating society. Extending from the tradition of Psycho came a subgenre of horror that took this fear of the normal and specified it to the fear of growing old. These were called hagsploitation films, and they belonged to a short-lived wave of films in the 60s and 70s which feature aging starlets and focused on a grand dame guignol, a gothic archetype of a distinguished older woman that extends from the grand guignol tradition. A 19th century theater that specialized in macabre, gory horror shows designed to scare audiences. According to scholar Peter Shelley, the Grand Dame Guignol, or Psycho Biddy, or Hag, can either present as a mentally unstable antagonist, or a woman in peril protagonist, whose mental state deteriorates as she's victimized throughout the film. But most often, she's the unstable antagonist, an older woman who struggles to deal with the process of aging and resulting social exclusion, which is highlighted when she's paired with a much younger actress. The Grand Dame is often deranged, and attempts to trap herself and those around her in time. And in Shelley's words, this refusal to accept reality and the natural process of life exemplifies the fear of aging and death, and implicitly, a fear of women. Whatever Happened to Baby Jane is widely considered the first hagsploitation film. It stars juggernauts of the Hollywood Golden Age and real-life enemies Betty Davis and Joan Crawford as Jane and Blanche, Sisters who, at different parts in life, experience stardom, but now live in a lavish house together in solitude. Jane is our psycho biddy, a former child star who, in her desperation to relive her glory years, has become deranged. She's the caretaker of Blanche, who was formerly a successful actress as a young adult, until she was confined to a wheelchair from an accident we're led to believe she suffered at the hands of Jane. Throughout the film, Jane becomes increasingly violent and detached from reality, a growing threat to herself and the people around her, especially Blanche. Things culminate in a massive fight. Jane abducts Blanche and drives her to a beach, where it's revealed that it was actually Blanche who tried and failed to kill Jane, but was injured in the process, then framing Jane for her injury and driving her mad with guilt. The movie ends with Blanche getting help from the police and Jane singing her creepy little song on the beach for a crowd of gawking onlookers. Now, hagsploitation has drawn a bit of criticism over the years for what people saw to be an exploitative use of these older actresses, incredible talents who had been forcibly aged out of the Hollywood machine and were now forced to perform what some have described as an old lady minstrel show, cartoonishly lathering themselves in makeup and carrying out a degrading caricature much beneath their station as highly respected artists. I mean, conspicuously, there is no genre of B-movies about psycho grandpas who refuse to stay in their socially imposed roles. It's a very gendered thing. So hagsploitation movies stoke our fears of aging, but walk a very thin line between empathy towards old women and mockery of them. It's never always clear which side whatever happened to baby Jane leans towards. The horror of this film lies in Jane's anachronism her refusal or inability to accept her role as an old woman and retreat from society accordingly. Our terror comes from seeing Betty Davis wearing an ill-fitting, dated dress, pigtails, and white makeup that highlights the deep lines in her face. We are uncomfortable with this uncanny presentation. There's something ridiculous about it. And this transgression will scare you, or make you laugh, or worse, both. So it's often hard to tell in this film if we're scared of what society does to us when we get older, or if we're scared of Jane. Scholar Charles Derry describes the tone of the film as poignancy mixed with voyeurism and revulsion. But for me, poignancy triumphs revulsion here. 
Because ultimately, I think Baby Jane is more empathetic to the psycho biddy than its many iterations are. The film spotlights Jane's social isolation and the tragedy of her obsolescence. You can laugh at Jane for her terrible performances and ill-fitting dresses, but when she regresses into her frightened, childlike state, you feel awfully for her. And then with the big reveal at the end, the movie encourages us to forgive Jane for her sins. In some exploitation movies, the hag is vanquished by being killed, but in Baby Jane, it's closer to what happens to Norman Bates. She's fully regressed into an alter ego unbefitting to her age, and completely submissive. By ending the film in broad daylight as opposed to the sisters' cavernous house, we see Jane stripped of her power. Pitiable, publicly scorned, and unbeknownst to her, old. It's tragic. But what Baby Jane succeeds in, where other high exploitation films fail, is that it lets you in on the joke with the actresses. If you've heard of this movie before, it's likely because it's largely remembered as a camp classic. Betty Davis and Joan Crawford are delivering the most outlandish, over-the-top performances here, and you can really tell that these women are having a lot of fun. Many lesser high exploitation films, like Straight Jacket or Whoever Slew Auntie Rue, are much more restrained in their approach to the Grand Dame. She's often a woman in peril who's constantly in distress, yet is inexplicably capable of murder. And the actress often starts the film out with an over-the-top performance, but slowly descends into naturalism by the end. If the meta-narrative of an aging starlet is so imperative to the exploitation film, then you want to feel like the actress is enjoying herself. It needs to be balls-to-the-wall insane, or else it just leaves you either fearing or pitying the character for being old. As scholar Timothy Sherry writes, Whatever happened to Baby Jane can be seen as a meeting point between melodrama, horror, and comedy. A vital moment when the audience was presented with the tragedy and horror of being old in post-war America, but learned to deflect it with laughter. The substance, while not explicitly a exploitation film, bears many traits of one. Elizabeth Spargle shares a likeness to the woman in peril Grand Dame. She doesn't start out the film as mentally unstable, but as she's more and more victimized by Sue, she becomes increasingly erratic, muttering to herself, banging her head against the floor and walls, and violently clawing at her own face. Elizabeth, like many Grand Dames, is juxtaposed to a younger mirror image of herself, and violently clashes with her. She's punished for transgressing her role as an older, obsolete woman by choosing to take the substance, and in the end, she's destroyed by it. Elizabeth is also played by Demi Moore, whose superstar career spanned several decades, but in recent years has really slowed down. Many people especially see the film as a meta-commentary on Moore's celebrity. She was once ridiculed for dating a much younger man, and she's undergone many cosmetic procedures in the public eye and has been scrutinized for it. So her age has been a topic of conversation for some time now. The thing is, one of the issues I had with the substance is that it never fully commits to being camp. The movie is heavily stylized, the sets and costumes are really colorful, all of the mise-en-scene is really generic and stripped back, and many of the supporting actors are delivering extremely over-the-top performances. But Moore plays Elizabeth Sparkle with a great deal of restraint, which puts her at odds with her camp surroundings, especially when we compare her subdued performance to Qualley's much more cartoonish delivery. I personally found this to be tonally jarring, and it made a lot of the more artificial and fun elements fall flat for me. Demi's naturalist and subdued performance, paired with the fact that Elizabeth is more of a woman in peril dame than a psycho biddy like Baby Jane, results in a relentless victimization of Elizabeth from the beginning of the film to its end. In Baby Jane, we see Jane deflecting her oppression in the public sphere by taking power wherever she can in the private sphere, at the expense of Blanche, of course. Her violent behavior is scary, but again, that's kind of part of the fun. She's deflecting her anger. But Elizabeth never really gets to exact that power. Other than the montage of her cooking and binge eating repulsive French food to get back at Sue and destroying her apartment as she does it, we never really get to see her be violent. And just when you think she's gonna rise up, she ultimately fails, choosing to resuscitate Sue, who in a fit of rage beats her older self to death. For the rest of the film, we only see Elizabeth twice, first as her battered, aged corpse, and second as a face stretched across Monstra Elizasu. Because Elizabeth is a victim with no agency, who is also vanquished at the end of the film, the substance can be read as tragic for sure, 
but it can just as easily be read as punishment for Elizabeth's hubristic quest to be beautiful. Body horror also has its origins in the Grand Guignol, this time in its reliance on gore. Back during the days of the Grand Guignol, the success of a performance was judged by the number of spectators who fainted or vomited. The same can be said for body horror. Body horror is concerned with our fears towards transformations of the body, the corporeal. As scholar Xavier Aldana Reese explains, the workings of a body horror involve the inscription of horror onto the human body by virtue of a change or series of them that transforms the perceived normal body into a negatively exceptional or painful version of itself. Often, a character in a body horror film will either start the film disfigured or they'll be confronted with their corporeal form, their body, as it undergoes a major life-threatening change. And if they don't try to annihilate whatever is inside of them that's changing their body, other people will, as this body poses a perceived threat to the status quo by way of being different. According to Reese, there are two major forms of body horror. There's the kind where our disgust stems from watching the violent physical transformation of a character being attacked by an outside force. And the other is a more supernatural kind, where we're disgusted by a metaphysical imposition upon a character that transforms their body in terrible, often painful ways. Reese says that the horror of the latter type is more voyeuristic. I think The Fly is the best example of the latter kind of body horror. It was made by David Cronenberg, who more or less popularized the body horror genre with this movie. He had made several body horror films before this, but The Fly was considered to be his first of this kind to achieve mainstream success and acclaim. Cronenberg's filmography is characterized by its fascination with the limits of the human form and all the socio-psychological issues underscoring our relationship to our bodies and the bodies of others. The Fly is very simple. Based on a much different 1958 film of the same name, Cronenberg's is about an eccentric scientist named Seth Brundle, played by Jeff Goldblum, who has recently developed a teleportation technology. The film is framed by a romance he begins with a science journalist named Ronnie, played by Gina Davis, who serves as witness to the horrors that unfold. Essentially, one night Seth is upset about Ronnie seeing an ex-boyfriend, gets drunk, and decides to put himself through the teleporter, despite knowing that the machine is dangerous. He unknowingly enters the telepod with a fly, causing a catastrophic fusion between himself and the insect, which leads to Seth slowly transforming into a grotesque human-insect hybrid called the Brundle Fly. As his human body deteriorates, he adopts other supernatural fly-like abilities, like an increased libido and the ability to walk on walls. Even more terrible, Ronnie finds out she's pregnant with Seth's baby and is unsure whether the offspring will also carry the DNA of a fly. With the support of her formerly insufferable ex, Stathis, she attempts to abort the fetus, but is kidnapped by Brundlefly in the process, who pleads with her not to kill all that's left of the real him. In a desperate attempt to reverse the transformation, he violently attacks Stathis and attempts to jump into the pod with Ronnie so that he, she, and the fetus can merge into one. Instead, he alone falls in and becomes a completely unsustainable, injured hybrid creature. The injured Brundlefly pleads with Ronnie to kill him. She does, and is left crying over his remains. What is immediately striking about the fly to me is that, while the gore is very difficult to watch, the movie is much more sad, devastating even, than it is scary. The fly spends a great deal of time developing the characters and challenging our assumptions about them. It even has us rooting for status by the end. And because of this, it provides a great deal of insight into Seth's mind. The screenplay, which is one of my favorite ever written, really encourages you to ponder the moral and philosophical implications of Seth's plight. During his decay, Seth oscillates between terror over what's happening to him Help me. and excitement about being freed of his human form. That's not too terrible, is it? Most people would give anything to be turned into something else. And so, as we recoil from Seth's grotesque, rapidly decaying body, we're faced with the conflict of having to empathize with him, greatly. Because of Seth's social exclusion and his discussions of impurity and contagion, it might be contagious somehow, I wouldn't want to infect you. Many people read The Fly as an allegory for AIDS, which it very well could be. 
But Cronenberg has said that the film has a more general message, in that it's a metaphor for aging. Seth's skin becomes wrinkled and discolored, he loses teeth and hair early on, for a while he uses crutches. These are transformations we will all grapple with as we get older. As scholar Colin McGinn so beautifully puts it, all human life is metamorphosis, from fertilized egg to fetus, from baby to child, then the spurt of adolescence, adulthood, and then the long decline into old age, infirmity, and finally the rapidly decaying corpse. Being equipped with memory and self-consciousness, we are always aware of our own inevitable metamorphoses, of the body's temporal convulsions and rebirths. In the creature Brendelfly, we see our own lives speeded up, caricatured, but not falsely represented. McGinn talks about how the real horror of the fly is not in the transformation of Seth's body, but actually the fact that the fly was in him all along. Similar to Psycho and the horrors of the normal, the monster was lurking inside Seth, and by extension us, this entire time. The monster coming out of him is inevitable, and this inevitability is terrifying. It reminds us that we cannot reverse the effects of growing old, that our bodies will change and there's nothing we can do to stop them. And in placing us in Seth's shoes, the fly holds up a mirror to us and makes us feel seen. New York Times critic Alyssa Wilkinson raised a similar point to McGinn in her review of The Substance. She says, The movie is, appropriately enough, a mirror, and our discomfort reveals our own hidden biases and fears about ourselves being older, being famous, being seen, being loved, being usurped by someone younger and hotter, it's all here. Nothing like a mirror to remind you of what lurks beneath. But I think the substance is less effective a mirror than the fly. And here's why. The fly uses the Kafka-esque metaphor of a man turning into a fly to explore our fears of aging. So our disgust is cushioned not only by an empathetic script, but also by the fact that what we're recoiling from is a supernatural, impossible hybrid creature, something that isn't real. The substance, on the other hand, does not use metaphor. Yes, the actual substance drug is not real and serves as a metaphor for the way we treat our older selves, but Elizabeth's transformation for the majority of the film is not into a monster, but simply into an old lady. She is actually rapidly aging. Like any horror movie, the substance has a number of reveal sequences to scare the viewer, but every reveal prior to the creation of Monstra Elizasu is simply the reveal of a decrepit body part. An elderly finger, a lumpy, veiny, elderly leg, Elizabeth now with grey hair and rotted teeth, and then, finally, the grand reveal as an entirely geriatric Elizabeth, deformed by age. She has almost no hair, her back is severely hunched, one shot is just of her wrinkly, discolored bum. And the biggest response from the audience I watched this movie with during this sequence was when Elizabeth turns around to display one naked, heavily sagging breast. When this happened, the people around me screamed in terror, followed closely by laughter. These responses are aided by the film. Its suspenseful music, editing, and the reaction of Elizabeth all encouraged the audience to scream as they did. But in this moment, I felt very sad. Not for Elizabeth, but for all the elderly women I've ever known in my life, whose bodies are not so different from what had been displayed here. I was reminded in this moment of the naked old lady in The Shining, of Mia Goth and old lady prosthetics, and I was confused, because what I was watching was an explicitly feminist film about women's beauty standards, and here I was, surrounded by an audience screaming at the body of an old woman. There's something very cyborgian about Cronenberg's films. He's fixated on the idea of the body as technology, which makes his voyeurism over Seth's mutilation feel like a moment of awe over this creature he invented. Whereas Farjot's voyeurism over Elizabeth's elderly figure felt just gratuitous. And unlike The Fly, which spends a lot of time getting you comfortable enough with this character that when he dies, you're mourning a person you spent the past hour and a half getting to know, the dialogue in the substance is very sparse, so much so that you never really get to know Elizabeth at all. Who are her friends? Does she have any? Why is she single? Because the film is so stylized, every character is an archetype rather than a fleshed out person. 
but I don't think that serves it well in these moments. I feel bad for Elizabeth because I'm a woman and can project all my own feelings about beauty and aging onto her, but I also want to feel bad for her. And so I actually found myself empathizing more with Seth as a flyman than I did with Elizabeth as an actual person. I think the reason that sagging breast moment elicited such a big reaction from the audience is because outside of horror, when do we ever see a sagging breast on screen? One of the only instances I can recall seeing an elderly body portrayed in a light other than horror is in this Tom Ford campaign, which I saw for the first time over 10 years ago. Demi Moore did an incredible job with this film, and she deserves her roses. But let's put things into perspective. Betty Davis was seven years younger than Demi Moore is now when she filmed Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Yet the film relies heavily on Davis's aged appearance. Moore, on the other hand, like I said, has undergone extensive cosmetic procedures in her life, to the point that as a 61-year-old, she looks like she could be 40. She's nude for a lot of this film, and her body is certainly slightly outside the norm of the typical female body we're used to seeing, but it also barely shows the signs of aging of a 61-year-old body. And this is absolutely nothing against Moore, but only that older actresses these days are so nipped and tucked beyond recognition so as to spare us from the supposed horror of their bodies. The actual elderly female body is completely invisible to us as a public, and when we do see it in horror as a jump scare, it's often in the form of a younger actress wearing prosthetics, like Moore does in these later sequences. So as we get accustomed to this actress's body, which is still very much viable to male desire and the standards of beauty, of course it's jarring when we then see her again as a much older, much less viable form of herself. But in that moment of screaming at her sagging breast, are we actually holding the mirror up, or are we just scared? In his book, The Culture of Narcissism, Christopher Lash talks about the way modern life alienates us from each other and from ourselves, thus turning inwards and adopting new, radical behaviors, like working out. And he has this great quote where he says, As we lose the ability to perceive ourselves, we lose the ability to clearly perceive others. I think Latch's book applies very well to the themes of the substance, but also in our reactions to it. The more we become alienated from each other and from older generations, we experience a cultural dysmorphia, a collective fear of aging, and as a consequence of elderly people, that I don't think the substance very astutely comments on, but inadvertently blows up. And in a time where young women are taping their mouths shut to go to sleep and drinking from special straws to avoid wrinkle lines, putting retinol on their hands, getting baby Botox, I don't know if a movie that elicits such a reaction is necessarily helping. What is a fear of aging? Well, it's a fear of death. death is the only inevitable thing. There's no escape from it. Like Elizabeth, baby Jane, and Seth Brundle, we may try our best to reverse it, to buy ourselves time, but it comes for all of us. And so who can fault us for being terrified when our body shows visible signs of drawing closer to this moment, preparing itself for the inevitable? Oh, I'm like the crypt keeper! Okay, that's enough. What I think is so great about a hagsploitation film like Baby Jane or a body horror movie like The Fly is that they bravely tackle this concept. These movies are about control, losing it, the illusion of it, but they don't condemn those who try to maintain it. Baby Jane and Brundlefly are both incredibly complicated characters who command empathy from us no matter what we watch them do. And that's why these movies are such great mirrors. They're telling us that delaying the inevitable is futile, but that it's okay to be scared. The Substance is an explicitly empathetic film, there's no doubt about it. But women's bodies have always been a canvas on which to project all our anxieties about aging. And the movie comes at a dire time, when being an old woman is more taboo than ever before. So to cut the metaphorical legs off its character building and present Elizabeth's aging body not once, but four times as a jump scare, 
is just something we might not be able to afford right now, although I'm glad it got the conversation going. I want to end with a quote from scholar Jesse Stommel, who argues that we need to reconstitute the way we view aging, dying, and dead bodies. He says that our culture strips dead bodies of their substance, for lack of better words, that we fail to approach images of horror with any critical voraciousness, instead consuming them with passive amusement or reprobation, disgust, or terror. Instead, we need to make the body vital again. He says, The dead body reminds us that we are always in a state of constant decay and reanimation, reinventing ourselves intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually, but also repairing physical damage, replacing dead cells with live ones, and collecting more and more layers of flesh all the while. We grow old, wrinkle, rot, reek, and break little by little. Our organs fail, our skin cultures fungi, and our stomachs house hundreds of bacteria species. We are losing our individuality, our singularity, more and more as our identities proliferate like screen names in the glow of our computer screens. And going against the grain of much of the thinking on the subject, I argue that none of this is such a bad thing after all, and instead offers us increasing opportunities for mutiny, to rise not from the dead, but like the dead. If this video got you in the mood for spooky season, and you're looking for more, then you'll love this brand new commentary on Night of the Living Dead, hosted by Rift Tracks. If you aren't familiar with Rift Tracks, they're a comedy group comprised of former actors and writers from the iconic film review show Mystery Science Theater 3000. Rift Tracks produces commentary tracks where the hosts and a variety of special guests commentate or riff on a wide range of films and TV shows. Rift Tracks has been in the game for almost two decades now, and excitingly, they recently joined Nebula. Nebula is a streaming service that's creator-founded and creator-led, which means we get a ton of creative control over the videos we make. Right now, you can see my original series, Taboo on Screen, as well as all my past videos ad-free on Nebula, and you can even watch Nebula videos offline with their app. In Taboo on Screen, we look at films that challenge and sometimes offend our sensibilities, covering difficult topics like whether we should get rid of sex scenes, the films of Todd Salons, Brooke Shields and the controversy around Pretty Baby, and the wacky world of John Waters. Taboo on Screen is just one of a whole host of prestige original series on Nebula, made by some of your favorite creators. We're taking the art of video making to a whole other level and providing a wide range of thoughtful content. You can think of Nebula like Netflix for people who love cultural commentary, and an impossibly wide range of other fascinating subjects as well. Rift Tracks Live Night of the Living Dead is the first in the Rift Tracks commentary series that will be going up every Saturday, this one being on the camp horror classic Night of the Living Dead. I feel like at this time of year, the only thing to get me in the mood for Halloween is to watch scary movies, but the thing is I'm a huge scaredy cat. Like, trust me, the fly kept me awake for about a week. You're welcome. So what better way to immerse yourself than watching a movie cushioned within a genuinely hilarious commentary track? I'm super honored to have my videos played alongside these commentary legends. Definitely check them out on Nebula if you haven't already. If you're interested in watching some really amazing original content, you can sign up using the link below and you can support me directly and get Nebula for a 40% off annual plans. On October 1st, we also introduced guest passes for Nebula subscribers. Monthly subscribers get one guest pass per month, and annual and lifetime subscribers get three per quarter, which means your friends can also plunder all the fruits that Nebula has to offer, no restrictions at all. Best of all, no payment info is required to redeem them. Enjoy! So go to nebula.tv slash broeydechanel, or click the link in the description for 40% off right now. Special thank you to Syed Hassan, Mal Pertui, Morgan, Cooper Stimson, Nadia C, Nick, Jenny Eller, J. Frost McFinnegan, Gabriel M, The Wiz Daniel, Edward Yu, Andrew Nguyen, Connor O'Keefe, Sharma, Daniel Sardunas, Jenya, Ryan Blythe, Maya Kameva, Naomi Nakagawa, Scott Barnett, Julia Campana, Mr. Allen, Alexis, Navis Bullock, Carrie Gavin, RSS, Fridjof Holstrom, Alex Short, and Kelly Wolf for supporting this channel.